<laughs> okay, um, so I'm Henry Stewart. My, I am Chief Happiness Officer at Happy. I hope you all have a Chief Happiness Officer, yes? Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, somebody asked me, have you become a Chief Happiness Officer? You just decide to be to make it your title. <laughs> people that didn't tell, people in all sorts of places have decided yes to do that. So, um, I'm going to... Uh, happy, <coughs> happy workplace is my aim even with this audience, is to challenge you a bit. <coughs> to make you think again about how organisations should be run, about how, what management is about. Um, but also to give you some ideas to take away. Okay, anybody heard of Happy before this? Before you read I was on this? Anybody at all? One person? <laughs> okay, a couple? Good. Okay, we, we're a training business. We've been around for 30 years. Um, initially, IT training, helping people enjoy <coughs> using computers. And now we help people transform into happy workplaces. Um, so, uh, we win the best workplace list five years in a row. So what we're going to be talking about is partly based on our own experience and partly based on some of the fab companies we met there, including Google, um, and looking at what they had in common, what it was that made a great workplace. But first, let me ask you to put your hands up if you agree with our core principle. Our core principle is, People work best when they feel good about themselves. Hands up if you agree with that. Okay, if that's the case, what should be the main focus of leadership in an organisation? Making people feel good, making people happy. Hands up if you work for an organisation where the main focus of leadership is making people feel good. Okay, we've got some. Excellent. Work where? The happiness centre. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Directors and their jobs. Name? Um, digital detox. Digital detox? Google. Google, excellent. Okay. Um, I was uh, on a panel with the head, with, not, with, the, with the chair of one of the business's biggest retail companies. And when I asked that question, he put his hand straight in the air and said, Yes, at my 80,000 strong company, that is the main focus of leadership. Any guesses which company? Which British retail company? Yeah, John, John, Lewis. John Lewis, absolutely. It wasn't Sports Direct, I can tell you that. <laughs> it was John Lewis who went on to say how they spent, at the last board meeting, they spent 20 minutes discussing the numbers and three hours discussing people and how they them to help them feel valued and motivated. Do you, if you, does your senior team spend at least five times as much time discussing people as numbers? Um, one to think about. I don't know if you know the John Lewis story, but it was set up by, by uh, I've got to put his name, Spaden, Spaden, Spaden Lewis, uh, in 1929 as a workers' mutual, with at the core of the Constitution the rule that every decision they make should be based on how happy it makes the staff. And that's how they grew from one haberdashery store in Oxford Street to. to <coughs> massively bigger organisation they are now. So, this is, uh, and there's involvement, lots of involvement in this, so my first question to you, discuss with your neighbour, if I can get this thing to work, is how would your, no, not that one, not that one either, <laughs> back to that, how would your organisation be different if the main focus of leadership was making people feel good and not try and get this to work? <laughs> 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 discuss with your neighbour, how would your organisation be different if the main focus was uh, making people feel good. This is not a debate. I don't want you to say whether it's a good idea or a bad idea. I want you to pose that hypothetical. <coughs> what would your organisation be like? What would it feel like? What would it be like to work for?
but just one or two words from people. How would it be different, anybody? We'll be happier. Excellent. Better customer service. Better customer service. Increased productivity. Increased pro I love this. Yes, any more? So there's a quick show of hands. How many think they your organisation would be an even better place to work? Hands up. How many think it would be more productive? More innovative? How many of you want to make sure it happens? Ooh. This is not just the leadership. We've worked with organisations where people do it from the bottom. You know, everybody can have an impact. Okay, we'd like to see some evidence that this works. Yeah. Yeah? Uh, you know the best place to work, this has been running for decades. There's a guy called Alex Edmonds, who was at Water Business School, who wondered, do the best places to work perform better? Good question, yeah? Um, to make the metrics easy, he looked at stock market listed companies, and he looked, compared, if you'd invested in the best places to work over 25 years, how would you have done compared to the stock market index? And he found that if you say the, business, uh, the pension that you'd invested and by the end was worth £100,000 in the S&P, if instead you'd invested in the great workplaces, which you could have done, uh, all listed every year, it would be worth £236,000. That's the hard financial difference um, that, that creating a great workplace makes. And if you have a pension, make sure you know it's in that kind of company. It makes a difference. Um, the same is true, how many here aren't in a, in a own a not-for-profit of any sort? Public sector, charity, anybody? One, two, three, a few. Okay, let's take the NHS. The King's Fund did a study looking at engagement in hospitals. All that data is out there. And you won't be surprised to know that if staff are more engaged, patients are happier. Yeah, makes sense. But it's also the case that if staff are happy and engaged, less people die. Okay? For every 96 that die in a hospital where staff are highly engaged, 103 die where they're disengaged and unhappy. You know how many, how, how many deaths that is? That's 5,000 deaths a year in the UK alone result from unhappy, uh, disengaged workforces. Um, and it's the same, obviously, in wherever. Happy workplaces save lives. And if you're sick, make sure you go to a happy hospital, because it will make a difference. <laughs> Um, now, I will put one caveat on the happiness thing. We did have one uh, client where uh, they delegated to somebody to make people happy, and this guy went out and bought lots of hula hoops and games and made people have fun. I mentioned happiness before and afterwards, and it went down. Um, any idea why it went down? People don't like being forced to have, uh, to have fun, yes. And also, when I'm talking about happiness, I'm not talking about hedonism. I'm not talking about in the moment, fine glass of wine, nice piece of music, whatever. I'm talking about eudonism, which is long-term fulfillment. Um, that's what we're looking for. So let me ask you uh, another question. Let me ask you to cast your mind back over your working life and think of one particular time where you're really proud of the results you produced. Hopefully you've got lots to choose from, yeah? But let's, I want you to think of one specific occasion. Nod your head if you've got one uh, time in mind, yeah? Okay, I'm going to ask you some questions. <coughs> Hands up if it was a time when you were really well paid. Have we got one? Excellent, not even the Google person, no? Okay. Um, hands up if it was a time when communication was particularly good from your manager. Okay, that's probably a third. Hands up if it was a time you had a great manager. That's okay, that's getting on three quarters. Hands up if it's a time when you're challenged. Okay, I'd say that's 80%. Hands up if it's a time when you are trusted and given freedom to make your own judgment. Yeah? I've asked that question of thousands of people, from city banks to charities, from directors to frontline staff. The answer is always very similar. It's not about the money, though we all deserve to be well paid. It's not about communication. Are you challenged? Do you have freedom and trust? Yeah? Would you like a quick tip on how to give people more trust and freedom? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah? Okay, how, how many of you are managers just out of interest? Okay, my, okay most, okay. Um, how often do you ask somebody to come up with a new idea, a new problem, some kind of solution, and ask them to bring it back for approval? If you do that, and raise your hands. Is that something you do? Okay, I'm going to ask you to miss out the last step. I'm going to ask you to do something called pre-approval, which means you approve the solution before they've thought of the solution. Make sense? I'll explain this a bit. Um, this is our old cafe at Happy. Um, 
We had a 19 year old in charge, she said she'd like to improve it. What we didn't do was say, show us a plan or let's form a committee. What we did do was agree a budget, check she understood the look and feel of happy and left her to decide for herself what it should be like. I saw it for the first time uh, when I, when I walked, walked in and it was like this. This is the after, by the way. And we'd like to think we're a colourful company, so it's, it fits very well. But how do you think that 19-year-old, three months into her first job, felt walking into her cafe every day? Elated, motivated, <coughs> happy. Um, and very different if it was almost her cafe, but so-and-so insisted on this and so-and-so insisted on that. It was her cafe. Um, there was a trainer sent me an email some years ago saying, um, I love the three things you've done to improve. Uh, things that are happy to make these serve the customer. I looked at the three things, and the first thing that struck me was I had no idea they'd happened, right? Because they hadn't come across my desk for approval. But then I looked again and spotted if they had come across my desk, I'd have rejected two of them, right? Because I thought up a lot of the ways things happen at happy. I use my best thinking. I reckon my thinking's pretty ace. So I am a natural barrier to change, like most managers. Because when you're a manager and somebody gives you an idea, you have to improve it, don't you? You have to, that's your role, isn't it? How many of you have put your best ideas up to your manager and had them improve it? <laughs> Not a great experience normally. So, um, let me give you a big example, our website. In the early days of our website, I was very involved. I would say, we need this, we need that, and can we take that away and do that? So the person in charge of the website never really felt in charge of the website. Has anybody been in that situation where, yeah, yeah, familiar? So. We decided we would pre-approve the website. Now that does not mean saying do whatever you like. I'm going to give you three options here. Do you like to be told what to do, have complete freedom, or freedom within guidelines? Hands up if you like to be told what to do. <laughs> no surprise, nobody at all. Hands up if you like complete freedom. <coughs> yes, there's always a few anarchists around, that's good, we like them. Hands up if you like freedom within guidelines. Yeah. And in a more representative sample, <laughs> that's normally about 90% at least, like the freedom within guidelines. So on the website, we didn't say, do whatever you like, right? We had a branding exercise, so the branding was clear. We agreed the metrics, how many people visited and how much income can be generated. Uh, Johnny went on the best search engine optimization training he could find, so he had the skills. And we also insisted that he be talking to users. We didn't need to know what they were saying, you just need to know that dialogue was happening. Those were the guidelines. <coughs> and when I saw, the, I saw the website for the first time the night before it launched, it either went up or it didn't go up. And it wasn't what I was expecting. It absolutely wasn't what I'd have created. But that's the point. If you truly delegate, you do not get what you would have created, you get what they create. Um, but it was completely within the guidelines, so up it went. And when we got the metrics a couple of months later, Visitors had trebled, and income had doubled. Even without the benefit of my expertise. <laughs> so my question to you is, what could you pre-approve on Monday? I'll let you off tomorrow. <coughs> what could you pre-approve on Monday? Discuss again. Talk to somebody behind you. Or in front of you. Not everyone behind you. <laughs> One or the other. <laughs>
guy who's facing Cheltenham, who you may have heard of, um, who really likes pre-approval. Um, and in fact, they've got a book, The Happy Manifesto. They so like that, they've got their own GCHQ copy of that. And they took pre-approval one step further. GCHQ needs to be at the forefront of technology, right? So they managed to get my, not the leadership, with some people in the middle, managed to get a million pound budget from directors for innovation. And being geeks, they set up a crowdfunding site, you know, and said, you could say, I want 500 pounds for this, or 10,000 pounds for that, or 500 pounds for, for something else. And they got lots of ideas. Who would normally then make the decisions on who got, them, who got the money? Up the chain, the directors, someone like that. What they did at GCHQ was they divided <coughs> the million pounds into 100 sets of 10,000 pounds and gave it to the most junior people in the organisation to decide. I've got a friend, a colleague there, who had a £10,000 idea for a new piece of te te technology to improve communication. In the past, it, it would have needed five levels of approval, and he probably wouldn't have bothered. Put it on one shot, the name of the site, it was funded within a week, it was <coughs> implemented in two weeks. Now think about that, that you've done two things there. First, you've massively improved the, increased the speed of change. And secondly, you've just changed who does it. And who actually probably knows better about technology? The frontline geeks have just joined, or the senior directors have been there 40 years. Which is true not just in technology, but in, in most things. You want to get your decisions as close to the front line as possible. Yeah? You know, why are all these approvals happening? Why do, do, there should be somebody owning decisions? That, and Happy, for instance, uh, one decision, one thing got changed this year was our prices went up. I didn't discuss it, my management team discussed it, one person owns that, he decides, he doesn't take it to any meeting, he can consult if he wants. Um, uh, but as a result of that, I'm happy I only attend one meeting a month. Because we don't have meetings to discuss decisions and things like that. People are responsible for that. Um, it sweeps away a lot of the bureaucracy. Here's, a, here's one of the most innovative companies in the world. <coughs> Who's heard of Birdsock? Anybody? Yes. yes. Birdsog, um, you know, anybody involved in care in any way? Anybody care in the care industry? You know how it works that um, you, you're a carer, you get a, a list of who you've got to see, half an hour with so-and-so, five minutes with so-and-so. Does it work? No, it doesn't. Four nurses in the Netherlands in 2008 decided they wanted to change it. They would decide how much time they spent with the patients. Those four nurses are now grown a little bit. There's 14,000 people now work for Birdsaw. Without, and that's not venture capital, they are social enterprise. That's uh, 14,000 and uh, as one of them said at one of our conferences, I feel now I've got my vocation, my vocation back. They aren't any managers at Birdsaw. There's a CEO, yeah, but they work in teams of 10 to 12 and they decide together. Now. Do you think this method, spending more time with patients, uh, them deciding, it must be more expensive, mustn't it, than the, the expert resource plan they decide for everyone? What do you think? More expensive or cheaper? <laughs> I'm going to tell you cheaper. Uh, it was Ernst and Young, I think, he did a study and reckon it would save the Dutch healthcare system 2 billion euros. Why? How can you spend more time with patients and it costs less? <laughs> yeah, they swept away 30% of the cost by getting rid of the management. But also, by spending more time with patients, you spend less time in hospital and so forth. Yeah? So, what is the role of the manager? Now, let's say a quick, are you ready for a quick quiz on this? Yeah? Okay. Um, this is from Google. Uh, who's the Google person? Oh, she's just uh, out lunch. <laughs> You'll know Project Oxygen, yeah? Do you know Project Oxygen? Yes. Yes, oh yeah. We, we had a conference. <laughs> that's, that's lucky. Um, <laughs> we had a conference here ourselves about five years ago and they shared Project Oxygen with us. And um, I, basically, being, being Google, they looked at the data, right? They wanted to find out what's the most important behaviors of managers, and they looked at the data. And they came up with eight. Your task, quick, 30 seconds with your neighbour, which are the two most important, ranging from good communication, especially listening, to express interest in your people, to clear vision. 30 seconds, which is the most important? Which are the two most important?
two of them. Yeah? No voting for everything, that's cheating. Okay? So, how many think one of the top two is good communication, especially listening? Oh, not many. Uh, can express interest in your people. Oh, lots. Be productive, results orientated. Empower, don't micromanage. Hey, virtually everyone. Help with career development. Key technical skills. Be a good coach. Clear vision. Okay, you I think did, I think this is the best audience I've had actually. I've done this about over 100 organizations. This was, this was good. So, in third place was express interest in your people. In second place was empowered and micromanage. And in first place, the single most important behavior of managers was be a good coach. <laughs> How many got both those top two? Excellent. So as I say, it's very rare to get a vote of ten percent. I had one, one group of chief executives where not one of them got being a good coach, and they even asked afterwards, "Why is that part of our job?" <laughs> um, why is it part of your job? Let's look at that. Who's had a coach at point some point in their career? Okay, quick. What do they do for you? One line. Career development. Career development. Ask good questions. Ask good questions. Help me sort out those of shit. <laughs> do you, do they tell you what to do? No. no. Do they ask you questions? Yes. Yes. Do they build confidence? Yes. Do they help you find your own solution? Yes. yes. That's the role of the manager, right? Yeah. yeah. yeah that's the role. Um, let's say you're at work. You get a note from your manager saying, "I want to see you at two o'clock." Do you feel excited? No. <laughs> <laughs> we should do. We should do. Don't, too many managers see their role, with it. and it's not their fault, they see their role as the expert, the decider. Yeah? Um, the male the manager is not to show how clever I am, it's to show how clever my people are. Yeah? And it's, that's the role to build confidence, uh, uh, ask questions, help people find their own solution. I could say much more on that, but I know I've got, somebody's got his eye on me here. So I'm going to quickly switch to another key point, which is, at Happy, we believe, celebrate mistakes is a key principle as well. But I'll get that. <laughs> Everyone believe in celebrating mistakes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, don't need to tell you about that then. Oh, good, okay. And happy, our aim is to. I don't get this, sorry. To <laughs> celebrate mistakes. It's good that I've got there, isn't it? Yeah. Um, our aim is that people should have joined their work 80% of the time, right? 80% of the time. We measure it. And it's 73% at the moment, which isn't bad, particularly it's a rather nasty IT system just gone in. Um, um, so seven, uh, how do you get to join your work? You have purpose. Uh, but particularly, you are doing something you're good at. Yeah? Gallup has asked over a million people, do you get to do every day what you are best at? Guess what percentage say yes to that simple question? Any guesses? 40. 20, 40. 10. 10. <laughs> Do you know the answer? No, it was 17. <laughs> One in six. Um, but where people are, do answer in high proportions, those organisations are 40% more productive. Let's say you have an appraisal. Do you have appraisals? Hopefully not. Who still has appraisals? Oh no, get rid of them. Um, we had a vote this year. Should we keep the appraisal system? 85% said no, get rid of it. So we have uh, obviously the one-to-ones with your coach, and then we have a four monthly check-in with just a, you know, a half, half page thing. So, uh, get rid of the appraisals, yes. Uh, Amy here look forward to the appraisal. Oh, one or two do, okay. okay. Most, it's very rare, but uh, there we go. Where was I? Ah, uh, strengths. So say you have your appraisal and you get your strengths and your weaknesses, what do we normally get to work on? Yes, what's the alternative? Yeah, get to build your strengths, never mind those weaknesses. How many of you are parents? Let's say little Johnny comes home with AAACF. What do we focus on? 82% focus on the F. Whereas you could just say, look at all these things you're fabulous at. That's what we should be doing at work. Now I know I've got to come to a close, so I'm going to jump straight to... Um, would you like this summed up in three key points? Yes? Yes? Okay. Number one. Get people to do what they are good at. It's a deeply radical idea, which will never catch on, I know, but um, uh, <laughs> it's that small step, getting people to do what they're good at. Number two, give them the freedom to do it well. 
And number three, what's the role of the manager? Coach. Louder. Coach. Absolutely. Coach them to be their best. Um, uh, I'm seeking with Happiness Index and others to build a movement for happy workplace. I know you're all on board. Um, if you want to... Uh, a co an electronic copy of my book, simply email me there, at Henry Happy, and you also get on the monthly <coughs> newsletter. Um, uh, so feel free to do that. I've got one or two copies somewhere, I don't know. Um, if you can tell me something great about, your, about what creates happiness, uh, come up to me and see if you can get a book. Okay, um, I'll close there. I'm Henry, I'm happy, I hope you are too. Thank you.